people come in. Okay, I'm, sure. I want to give you the full the full hour here. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the seminar today. Um, I'm really pleasure. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Song Wunam from University of uh, Illinois. Um, I've known Song for quite some years. I, well, I knew his work actually uh, even earlier, I think when he was uh, a student at Harvard. Um, since coming to uh, UIUC, uh, Song Wu has done some really nice work around the 2D materials, string engineering, flexible stretchable electronics, or in them it. Um, Okay, I will go through some was a bio very briefly. Um, Sang Wu received his uh, BS degree from uh, Seoul National University and then his PhD uh, from Harvard University. Um, Sang Wu has received uh, many awards uh, and recognitions for his work. Yeah. Very briefly, I will talk a few, uh, including uh, TMS Early Career Award, NSF Career Award. Air Force and ONR uh, Young Investigator Award, NASA Early Career Faculty Award, and uh, a number of awards from URUC, uh, all the way ranging from research to teaching to advising. Very impressive. Um, so, Sang Wu, uh, I will have the podium. You have the podium. Uh, for, you can take the podium from now. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yong, uh, for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me uh, this morning. Um, I think it, last time I met Yong and uh, no, not met Yong. The first time I met Yong was uh, was when I was visiting NC State. Uh, I, I'm not sure you remember. That was when I was uh, looking for an assistant professor job. Like it's already like nine years ago, eight years ago. So it's been a while. <laughs> but but since then, right? We we, we met uh, in various conferences uh, around right two D and mechanics, and uh, that's where kind of my program uh, grew into the last uh, years. Um, so today I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about uh, kind of what we call mechanically coupled property in 2D materials. Um, so mostly these are uh, strain related uh, and also deformation related. So we wanted to explore an opportunity to, um, to basically control properties of material, these low dimensional materials by using uh, really the strength of uh, these mechanical deformations. So that, that's what we're mostly interested in. Um, so I just want to start with my talk with acknowledgments of uh, students and postdocs who did the work. And um, today I'm going to uh, highlight uh, the work by uh, Chase Cho uh, and also Jim Young Kim. That's the two uh, works uh, that I'm going to uh, uh, kind of talk about. Let me see if I can change to a pointer. Um, and also I just want to say if uh, there are students in the, uh, the audience, uh, I do have postdoc openings if you're interested in, um, in doing things that we're working on, uh, and there are uh, some alumni that have also contributed the work over the years. Um, so kind of the work, uh, I mean, the things I want to start with when I motivate the talk, and I think this is really not too surprising for a lot of mechanical engineers, uh, where you see a lot of structures uh, and surface textures even, or man made structures that have a very delicate and interesting architectures to it. Um, and if you're uh, uh, someone that studies biological systems, you ask the question, why do right, these biological systems uh, aim to or, or naturally create these type of interesting structures such as you see on the very top kind of panels where right, we see wrinkles, we see interesting textures on, on fruits. Um, uh, and, and of course, there are structures that would build on purpose right, with, with, with a goal of uh, adding additional functionality, for example, accordion and being able to play songs by having this corrugated uh, stretchable design that allows to uh, control the airflow, uh, for example, and, and or the helmet that help us to uh, achieve the, the toughness level that we need while it allows us to fold it in a very small form factor at the same time, uh, making it very lightweight. So as you can see, these structures are not made, uh, right, just for artistic reasons. Of course, that's a big part of user interfaces, but uh, at the same time, we aim for functionality. And it turns out a lot of these, as far as the structures that we build, are focused on mechanic properties. How do we enhance or change or uh, uh, combine uh, the intrinsic properties with mechanical property? And, and the things that we do is actually trying to ask the question, can we actually expand that concept just a little bit more? Uh, can we use a similar concept, but then ask the question, once you create these architectures to uh, or bulk of material, can we 
change how it interacts with light? Can we change how it interacts with uh, phonons uh, or, or thermal properties or magnetic properties, right? Um, electronic properties. So you can basically expand this um, kind, kind of combination in a, a little more than, right? traditional uh, mechanical properties uh, focus in, in, in our field. Um, so my research group really looks at this uh, kind of intersection. So I'm trained as a material scientist in my undergrad. And, and so I kind of have, have this uh, natural in interest in uh, trying to look into the properties of material. That's what I'm very interested in. And, and I start to get very interested in about combining that with, with the deformation uh, in the length scale and the periodicity of these deformation that can be created by mechanics uh, and utilize it towards uh, what we call uh, immersion properties. Can we actually do more than mechanical properties? Uh, of course, there are lots of interesting possibilities there, but can we do more? So that's that's really what we uh, are kind of, we're thinking there might be something else, right? We can contribute to. Um, so the types of material that I'm going to focus on today, uh, for some of you, it might be kind of uh, things you, you work on every day. For some of you, this might be very, very new. Um, so these are so-called atomically thin uh, or two-dimensional materials. Sometimes we use the term van der Waals materials as these are basically bulk crystal, uh, it's a monolayer of uh, van der Waals the stacked bulk crystal, right? For example, graphite will be one of the most prominent example where there are stacked layer of graphene uh, that turns out to be the very first uh, material that people got excited about, right? And it exhibited quite an interesting properties, uh, right? It's, it, it's just shown here. It's interesting just to think that these 2D lattice is, is stable in ambient. So that, that's kind of one of the very early kind of controversies in the field because, right, the 2D translational symmetry is not supposed to exist according to uh, these famous theories because there are thermal fluctuations. So that was kind of uh, resolved by um, by knowing or by recognizing the fact that these materials are rarely very, very flat. So mathematically speaking, there are always outer plane correlations. And that's really something that we started to notice and I'll, I'll talk more about. Um, but of course, there are lots of other materials that were uh, become very interesting once you know how to either make one layer of material by chemical vapor deposition process, uh, or when you're able to use brute force or mechanical exfoliation, use a scotch tape to start to tape it off from the bulk crystal. So that's uh, some, some kind of a lot of skills, but, but it's you know, possible where you can start to look into uh, things that are semiconducting to insulating. Um, and uh, in, in, in this talk today, I'm going to also briefly mention or talk about um, uh, semiconducting 2D materials, uh, particularly in its uh, optoelectronic properties, because it turns out uh, once you start to shrink it to model layer, there are some interesting uh, screening effect uh, that will happen, um, and that make it quite interesting to think about manipulating these uh, uh, light particle inside the material. So I'll, I'll elaborate more on that, but there are lots of material to work with. Um, and something that we recognize, and that was the initial discussion I, I provided on the thermal stability or stability of these 2D crystals, uh, right? There's these right, beautiful, beautiful theories uh, uh, in the 50s. Uh, and it turns out it, it kind of gives us this uh, uh, kind of led us to this, uh, this plot that we, we just kind of put together. Um, where the y-axis I'm showing here is the electron mobility or carrier mobility depends on uh, polarity of the material. Um, so you, that's how fast in a unit electric field, how fast the carrier will transport. So higher it is, faster it will transport. Um, for electronics applications, we do want them to be fairly high, right? That's what we would like them to be. So there are some of these uh, indium arsenide, gallium arsenide type of material, right? People are very interested in for, for their own right, high mobility applications, but they're very difficult to grow and things like that. That has been lots of uh, research interest in there, and that's where the 2D material right, exists. Um, and in my x-axis, this is a 2D bending uh, stiffness, um, where you can see that this number varies dras dras drastically as function of uh, uh, thickness of material or or uh, the dimension that we're looking at. So, for example, in the nanowire, nanomembrane, that's either the diameter 
for the thickness of the membrane uh, that we have been set for 100 nanometer or, or there are some uh, kind of variations so we would use this kind of areas to show that. Uh, organic semiconductor sits in here. That's also a game function of thickness of the material. Of course, bulk will be way, way far on the right hand side. Uh, but when you start to get to a uh, very thin thickness of the material, you start to realize, well, this number reduces dra drastically. It's simply um, right thickness effect and, and the stability of material in that particular thickness. And, and, and if you start to put some of the biological systems when it comes to bending, uh, it start to be comparable. So it's quite interesting, um, I mean, just to see this chart, but at the same time, it gave us this thought or interest in, well, if it's so easy to be deformed, so being such a low or diminishing bending stiffness, how about we actually actively utilize it uh, and start to couple our strategy of uh, uh, deformation to that of mobility, for example, if that was my y-axis or right optical properties so so that's kind of the chart that we're interested in creating right that's a piece of knowledge that we're hoping to create um by by doing this type of uh, operation so uh, in some way i think of this as right a slightly different way to do material science instead of making the new material uh, and then interested in grabbing the uh, existing material that but start to right play with the deformation if we could right do that in this case it, it's just a very good example um, so in my talk today, I'm going to talk about two major topics. Uh, one is a little more focused on deformation and strain. Um, and you'll see a little bit on uh, a little bit on uh, different uh, quasi particles. Hopefully it's not too uh, kind of something too, too different from what you're working on if you're right, trained uh, as, as mechanical uh, engineers. Uh, second part will be a, a lot more mechanical, as, as you see. So let's uh, get started. So before I get started, I just want to talk about uh, the light particle I mentioned uh, in the 2D semiconductor. So this is a one layer thick, or I should say three atom thick. So uh, for example, if it's, uh, for example, tungsten selenide, that's one of the material that we're going to look at. Uh, you have a mid-plane of tungsten and you have a sulfur or sel selenium, sorry, in this case on top and bottom. So it's a three atom thick uh, semiconductor. Um, and it's a dark, so-called direct gap semiconductor. So the optical transition is direct in momentum space. So what that means in real life is when you shine light, the transition is very, very efficient. Uh, so there's no need for right this phonon uh, uh, to get involved. Um, so that's good for optoelectronic applications. So what's actually really interesting for 2D um, is not that it's only thin, but when it becomes thin, if you think about electrostatics, um, so I have, let's say, electron hole pair, I get to create them. Um, in a bulk semiconductor, I have lots of materials on top and bottom. So, and those materials have a higher dielectric constant than the vacuum or ambient. So if you look at the field line uh, of the bulk versus uh, as simple as one layer, you start to see that the screening by the bulk components start to substantially shrink when it comes to single layer. So so-called the dielectric screening is gone. And what that means from this electron hole pair point of view is their binding energy. So in a typical semiconductor, we barely explain electron as electron hole pair, although we know when you shine light, electron will get to excited state and you have a hole at the valence band, you have electron hole pair, but we don't think of it that way because they are heavily screened so we can think of electrons or as a holes. Here, the screening is so little, now you have to treat them as together. So there's extra energy you need to consider or you have to treat an electron, excited electron as electron hole pair in the 2D semiconductor, which we call the exciton. So that's nothing but electron hole pair with a good binding uh, against the thermal fluctuation. So they're actually quite a robust inform or light particle, I would say, in a material, right? They would re emit as light, but they can pen, uh, kind of travel uh, in the material, right, uh, without binding. Uh, so create a light for, for a decent amount of time and length scale because they're stable. So I guess a bit long discussion on that, but so that really excited a lot of people to think about lots of unique opportunities. Um, can, how do we utilize this? Because that's a natural way, right? Information is transporting inside this or light is transporting the material instead of just electrons or holes. Um, so people looked at 
the, using this interesting strain or strain gradient to kind of collect these excitons and create a very efficient solar harvester, energy harvester. So this was a, a theoretical proposal. And, and so we're going to kind of show, right, we actually realized this piece of uh, uh, predictions or, or, or kind of uh, idea. Uh, and recently people also look at, well, if it's a uh, dipole, maybe I can use electric field with the right orientation to manipulate it and create an exciton transistor. And what's nice about exciton transistor is there's really no boundary between photons and exciton as, as much as in conventional electronic, right? Or the electron hole based system. So it's much more easier to manipulate. I mean, I guess it's much more easier to couple to photonics uh, component uh, compared to electronics. Um, there are lots of more exotic quantum type of applications. You can create an emitter by condensing these electron hole pair down to one. So you can get a single photon. So that's a single photon emitter. Or you can look at really, really very quantum mechanical uh, features of these. So some of the exciton condensation, lots of interesting possibilities. Um, so if I just show you what's been happening in our field, uh, there are two works that I want to point out. So one is really utilizing this dipole, so it's electron hole pair um, of exciton, and use external electric field to move them or to drift them, manipulate them um, as you generate and manipulate and collect. Now you created a circuit, right? That's composed of excitons. Um, and, but this work uh, required so-called heterostructure. You can see there are two layers because, right, if you have just one layer, these excitons are in plane. So basically you have two electron hole pair in plane and the vertical electric field is orthogonal to the in-plane dipole, so they don't talk to each other. Whereas if you have an out-of-plane dipole moment by having two layers of 2D semiconductors, so-called interlayer exciton, uh, you can do that. So I won't go into that, but that's how they did this and very interesting work. Um, and in 2015, that's kind of our interest. Uh, they, uh, another group at Sanford show that actually you can use not the electric field, but strain to also think about manipulating excitons. And, and the, the idea here is if when you apply strain, you start to change the band gap of your semiconductor. And when you change the band gap, exciton sees a path towards the lower energy of that band gap because of that state induced by strain. So perhaps we can utilize it to do something, right? So they, they showed some evidence of that by looking at exciton intensity, more are condensed or drifted towards the tensile portion of the portion. So that's why you're seeing higher intensity. I'll talk a little more about that in my uh, slides, uh, just probably next slide. But, but these are kind of the two uh, major ways that people have been kind of working with, right? So it's either some fancy interlayer exciton coupled with electric field or just a strain, uh, but now you can deal with the intra-layer. Intra so that's the one layer material excitonic system. Um, so as I said, we're interested in actively promoting or using this deformation to uh, to create different strain states or deformations in very thin materials. So here I just want to show you some of the approaches we've taken, whether that's um, shape memory polymer that's pre-programmed to right, shrink to a particular length scale when you heat it above the blast transition, or is pre-stretched blastomer that is able to right, relax back uh, because of that elastic nature, but then Right, because of the thickness differences, stiffness differences between your 2D and the substrate, you start to create interesting out of plane morphology, right? So that's quite interesting. And right, it kind of also goes back, ties back to the low mod, uh, low bending stiffness kind of argument I've made. And, and things could, could be made to certain sort of length scale with, with decent control. Um, you can even add additional interfacial layers to control adhesion stiffness that allow you to create more conformal and more uniform wrinkles. That's what I'm showing you here uh, by adding a couple more polymer layers on top of either shape memory polymer or elastomer. You can create much more uniform, almost like a grading structures of these 2D wrinkles. So it depends on what length scale matters, right? And what's the amount of local strain they're looking for because Length scale, radius, curvature, those parameters would change, right? Uh, some of the, uh, the, for example, strain that we're interested in. But nonetheless, you, you I mean, you can, you can do this, right? With a decent uh, control of, of the curvature length scale, for example. So uh, one example I kind of want to share uh, is really try to use the strain 
or I should say strain gradient to manipulate intralayer excitons. So we're going to deal with just one monolayer. So in this case, it's tungsten diselenide. So it's a tungsten in the midplane, selenium on top and bottom. Uh, and I simply created a wrinkle out of it. You start seeing this in a schematic drawing. And um, as you can kind of expect from uh, this drawing, if it right, th follows what we expect it to behave, then you're thinking, well, at the highest portion, since this is conformal wrinkle, I'm probably expecting some tensile strain on top if there's no much slippage and things work as we right, want them to be. Or at the bottom, uh, a valley of your wrinkle, we're looking at some uh, compression. Uh, and at some point in the middle, there might be right, uh, no, no strain. Uh, so we have some sort of strain gradient across right, the, the real space that we're looking at between apex and valley. Um, and if you show that in uh, band gap or energy of your electron hole right, at the apex and the valley, here, the dotted line shows how conduction band and valence band changes. But at the end of the day, what we kind of wanted to see is at the apex, what is this energy, right? This is the, when light shines, this is energy of uh, uh, the photon that will come out. So this is your band gap energy. And as you can see, as function of valley versus apex, you're seeing different levels of band gap, particularly the conduction band changes a lot. Uh, and that gives you strain control energy, uh, band gap energy control in real space. It's, it's kind of interesting where if you are an exciton, so if you're an electron hole pair sitting on a valley, sitting on this point, uh, they might see an opportunity to try to go uphill, I mean, geometrically speaking, and, and then try to gather around apex because the energy there is just lower. So it, it gives them an opportunity to get to a lower energy state and one way to show this experimentally is perhaps if I can excite only the valley, so I kind of right, do nothing with the apex, but simply excite the valley, uh, and then see if the exciton ever will travel to the apex at all. I mean, there will be natural diffusion when you right, dump energy, exciton, lots of exciton will be created, so you have a diffusion around the, uh, the valley portion of the material, but there might be an opportunity for them to travel to the next apex, right? And then maybe we'll see them right there, even though we didn't do anything, right, at that particular point. So, so that's kind of the thought, and that will be the uh, kind of direct kind of proof of this exciton transport along the strain gradient. So that's kind of what we uh, wanted to do. Okay, and that's what I'm going to show you briefly. So um, these look fancy and interesting conceptually, but uh, if you start to do these, it, these are, as I said, it's uh, lots of uh, hard work of mechanical exfoliation. Um, that's my uh, our one layer tungsten selenide that we exfoliate from bulk crystal. Um, and then this substrate had a pre-stretch to it um, with a skin layer uh, pre-made. So when you release them, release the stretch, you get uh, these wrinkle shape. Uh, there are cracks that you see because you have a Poisson, uh, right? The vertical direction, you have a, a, a tension by compression, by releasing the stretch uh, in, in the X direction. But if you find a region there, uh, you see these uh, high profile, these wrinkles are fairly uh, consistent, uh, uh, uniform. Uh, and you can do this uh, right, using different techniques to measure the height and the wavelengths, for example, of the wrinkle that we have created uh, with tungsten selenide. And the length scale, uh, just to uh, kind of, because you see some of these, uh, is that uh, the, from one peak to the other peak is about five micron, uh, and the height of the wrinkle is one micron. And we, we chose this uh, dimension uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, because we, we wanted to make this to be compatible with some of the optical techniques I'm going to use to probe this. So, uh, and it has to be right uh, above the diffraction limit. So that's why it's a little bigger, but um, I mean, things can be controlled. Um, so here is the uh, another flake uh, that was exfoliated, wrinkled. And one thing that we can do immediately that was right, uh, demonstrated a few years ago uh, is to look at where at what energy the photons are coming out. So what we do here is we shine uh, energy to our material. So let's say I'm shining blue, uh, green uh, laser. So it's a green light I'm shining in, uh, to my material. And I look at what 
color a photon that'll come out as function of position. And here is the photon energy or photon wavelengths uh, as function of the flake that I'm probing. So what's interesting here is you can see immediately um, at certain part of my material, there are bands of 790 nanometer, sorry, I don't have, uh, I didn't put the unit here, 790 nanometer emission, and some part of the material is 730-ish. So, uh, and this emission peak energy shows you the optical band gap of the material. So it's a single material, but by creating a wrinkle out of it, I am seeing a smaller optical gap, larger optical gap. Apex, it actually turns out the apex is where it has a smaller gap and it's consistent with the schematic that I showed you early on, right? Tension creates smaller energy of optical transition, compression creates larger energy and that we can do this in real scale of about five micron in spacing between these apex and valley. And you can do this, right? Uh, individual spectrum and really look at it. Uh, again, consistent with that map, that's what you're seeing and the tension and compression. And also, right? You can see the intensity is quite different. And that's kind of the argument that, right, years ago people made on the exciton drift. So if the apex has a smaller energy, right, if I shine valley, maybe the exciton will go to apex. That's why we're seeing more photons that's coming out. So at the same condition, I'm counting more photon. As a result, so-called the PL intensity is higher, photoluminescence intensity is higher. So that's what simply what it is. Um, and you can use uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy to also confirm it's really the lattice strain that we're dealing with. So um, and in this case, right, uh, you look at the shift at the apex of valley uh, that, that demonstrate there are different strains that, it, that are applied uh, to this material. So that, that's consistent with what we right, measure with PL and what we expected from what's right, previously demonstrated. Um, and you can do a lot more careful studies at Apex and Valley, see how, right, how, how well they're distributed, uh, right, um, and how robust they are with uh, so-called cycling, cyclic stretching, because this is on a soft uh, substrate, uh, right, polymer substrate cell or elastomeric substrate cell. You can stretch back and forth, and we just want to make sure, right, there's no slippage and these strain states were locked uh, stably there at the Apex and Valley. That's what uh, you're seeing there. Um, before I go into the drift business, uh, what, what we thought was interesting from this mechanical system is that things are reconfigurable. So here I just want to show you, uh, you start from a flat flake that was homogeneous everywhere in terms of emission, so about 740-ish, let's say. Um, but once you create a wrinkle, you start to split the energy between uh, closer to the 740 and then 750 or yeah, high, uh, smaller energy. And as you stretch again close to that initial flatness, you start to make them much more homogeneous. Uh, and then you can create this uh, pattern of energy split again. So you basically have this additional knob that right, didn't exist with traditional way of dealing right, this type of material where the strain reconfigurability is it could be put into use in a, in a useful way. So, so that, that is just to show uh, it, it is actually possible. That's why we also tested the uh, cyclic stability of the material. Um, so let's get into a little bit of uh, drip business. Um, so kind of the first thing we did, and, and I mean, I, I guess this is to help build the model that we show you. Um, but uh, something that we did was a little bit more kind of specific studies here, so-called time-resolved photoluminescence. It's really nothing but to probe the lifetime of these excitons. So you shine light with uh, short pulses, and then you look at how fast they decay. So that's what we're doing. Um, and what you see here is that as different states are, uh, strains are applied, we see different lifetime. And you can just see it not by fitting and analyzing any further that the apex or the tensile strain appears to give you longest lifetime. In flat appears to be somewhere in the middle, valley compression is the least, right, the shortest. Um, but what's interesting, I mean, this was just a point I'm trying to make, is that this was completely opposite to this experiment um, that people have done. So there are multiple groups have done this. So you basically put 2D semiconductor and you use a global banding. So this is not, Right, structure with strain gradients is a uniform strain uh, relatively to our structure. Uh, and what they have 
observe was when you apply tensile strain, so flat versus tensile, you're seeing lifetime is being shortened. So higher tensile strain, lifetime should be shorter. We're seeing longer lifetime. So we're, we're, we're very puzzled at this point. Uh, we just want to study more. And then now things are not consistent with what, what, been, what has been reported. So, so we decided to uh, think about a model and, and that really helped us to uh, predict as, as, at the same time, can understand our results better. Um, so uh, here I'm showing equation. Uh, it's really nothing but a continuity equation uh, of density of exciton. So that's my N. Uh, and I have a generation term, so that's my input photon energy. Uh, and some of them will recombine and become emitted. So you have something that will, right, you have a recombination term. Um, and you have another recombination, but not radiative. So these are thermalization processes, so uh, OGL annihilation. So basically this takes away density of exciton. Um, and typically, if you look at literature, that's about what you consider. Or maybe you consider diffusion, as I talked about, because you're shining light into a specific point. So you all of a sudden create lots of density of exciton because of density gradient, right? Then you get chemical gradient, you get diffusion. So that's kind of diffusion term. Um, but in our case, we do need to think about gradient uh, potential because in real space, as function of position, we're having different band gap. So that band gap allows exciton to drift. So we have a drift uh, mobility of these excitons. It's almost like electron mobility, but we, we do have an exciton mobility. Uh, and that's because we have an energy gradient. In a flat material, this is zero, right? So you have nothing to worry about, but now in this case, you do need to worry about. So that's what this really shows, right? So if you have an energy gradient, so let's say if your valence band is equal, so you don't need to worry too much about that, your conduction band basically right, gets a lower energy. So if you're an exciton, you want to drift towards a lower portion of the material. How far you go, right? Those are really uh, interesting questions. That's what this model and our measurement can help understand. Um, there are additional processes that are interesting, but I won't talk too much about it, but just by saying if there are anyone interested, there are also this effect of strain-induced dark to bright exciton conversion. It looks like uh, it turns out strain is so powerful, it can make those uh, dark exciton to become bright. Um, it's related to the energy uh, uh, shift uh, as kind of shown here, but I won't go into a lot of details, but when we consider all this with this equation uh, that you're showing here, we're able to actually predict our, and, and also right, explain our measurement uh, quite well. So let me just briefly show you a couple of slides, our measurement. Um, so here is the experiment, it's a very simple experiment. So I have a flat uh, sample, I shine laser. So that's my excitation beam, so it's a circular. Um, this is my emission beam. Not surprisingly, it's circular, but there's a diffusion. So you can measure the radius of that to talk about exciton diffusion as function of power, for example. So people have done that. Um, you can use that to calculate diffusion coefficient, for example. Um, so at the apex, same circular beam. But then if you look at the emission pattern, it starts to be non-circular anymore. Um, so you start to be looking like it's a bit squeezed, uh, right? Uh, uh, kind of perpendicular to the long axis, that's a dotted line, and it's more spread it out along the dotted line. So that's kind of first observation. Interesting. Um, and when you pump at the valley, the middle point between apex, so no light is actually being pumped into apex, you see a circular beam um, emission, but you also see additional peaks, satellite peaks on the two apex position. This was never right, expected, I mean, if there's no drift, right? Uh, that's what you don't see there. And then this is our model prediction based on the, the uh, equation I showed you. Uh, you can study more and you can be more qualitative, quantitative with, with the spectrum, with the model. And it turns out it, it fits very well. I, I, I think I can only say that uh, with our simulation or the model versus measurement and uh, yeah, there. Um, but what if, if the strain was so little? Um, so this is kind of our one control experiment um, where uh, if I go back one slide, if I pump the apex or the valley, you see satellite peaks or anisotropic emission. Um, but when you start to do the same thing, so either you pump the apex or the valley or the other apex, the emission is circular, or you don't quite see that, or again, circular, when the strain is relatively small. So in this case, it's about 0.8% versus the, the sample that we've been making is about 2%. 
Um, so then you can kind of start to do a little more ambitious, right? Or a more interesting experiment uh, and, and try to correlate that with the energy diagram that you're showing here, I'm showing here. So this is my energy of um, the, for example, the conduction band, that's another way to think of it, or band gap. Um, Apex, you have a lower energy, lower energy. So if I offset my pumping just by a little bit to the left hand side, you have barrier right here. So it's not supposed to go to the right, it only can go to the left. So if I pump here, you get very anisotropic emissions, right? So that that's right, really this this component is truly drift. And of course, you have a diffusion along the vertical line. Uh, if you put uh, that in the center, then you get equal intensity left and right. So they can go right to either left or right, or the same thing on the right hand side, right, a little offset it, pumping or um, in this case, if you have a sample that has an, an equal energy gradient at the left and right, you can see that at one point you get much more uh, exciton drift than you don't have on the other. And as I showed you earlier, if there's no very little energy difference, they don't go there. So these really taught us and also help us to demonstrate this drift of exciton across the strain gradient. So this is quite different from data, right? Electric field. Uh, that, that demonstrated quite an interesting way to manipulate in a, in a right, integrated fashion. Here, we can use strain gradient. And what's really interesting with the strain gradient, you can potentially reconfigure that. If you find a way to create a surface that's constantly reconfigurable mechanically, you can create a circuit that can right, drive the exciton through or it can block it. So it's an interesting way to think about right, ways to manipulate these. Of course, they're fundamental knowledge that we, we could also create by having these experiments and, and fit with the model and start to right, really predict these in a much more complicated string gradient. So these are uniaxial strain, right? The simplest possible now what if, right? You have biaxial strain, you have different strain surfaces, how would they behave? And so we're kind of building that as well. Uh, more, more, much more model-wise because that's way more easier. But but then can we create a surface that's really, really interesting when, when they deal with exciton transport uh, that may lead to advanced uh, functionality. So here are just some, some simulated uh, uh, results at, at a different strain and a different distance, for example, that we're working on. So this was our kind of right, a work on how to use deformation and strain as a way to right, deal with beyond intrinsic properties of uh, 2D materials. So here, right, I talked about exciton. Uh, and we're working with not just exciton, uh, right? Uh, I, I mean, some, some cases I'm collaborating, we're collaborating with uh, people with the right expertise to look at different uh, properties, but that that's kind of the, the studies or, or the knowledge that we're very interested in establishing in this space. Um, so in the next about uh, 15 minutes or so, I'd like to briefly talk about this interfaces and, and it also deals with a lot of a bit of deformation, but um, this was, I would say, more uh, uh, more related to mechanics and something that we we unexpectedly found. And it's interesting uh, um, how, right, how, how this also happened to be uh, somewhat useful. Um, so this is fracture, uh, if you are right in that community, and, and this is particularly fracture of metal thin films. Um, so if you have a polymer elastomer or a polyimid or any flexible substrate that people use right, for flexible electronics, uh, once it reaches above the uh, fracture strain, uh, the typical fracture surface that we see is it really is, right, you see I put a lot, uh, very straight crack, right? Uh, uh, when you, let's say, pull it this way, that's what you see, um, kind of mode one type of fractures um, uh, of, of metals, uh, copper and, and different metals that, that have been shown similar behaviors. They may have slightly different strain uh, uh, dependent uh, fractures, but, but they nonetheless show these very straight fractures I can see in this uh, cases. Um, if you go to fracture businesses with, with uh, advanced material, I, I do need to talk about this. It's not, not kind of what we worked on, but I just wanted to say that, well, then the question becomes, how do you guide the cracks, right? So that it's not so straight, for example, if that was your goal to, to increase, right, the toughness of material. Uh, and there are lots of, right, buyer inspire approaches where you put this hard, soft, hard, soft layers where, right, you create lots of interfaces uh, where, the interface could be a way to guide uh, the cracks right across the, the, the outer plane direction. So here, some of the cross-sectional views uh, showing that cracks 
propagate through the auto plane, but not straight anymore because the architectures that people put in and different strength of material or the soft uh, 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 step combination that you put it in there. So, so that's kind of very, very active research area where you, you could achieve very high uh, toughness, high strength of, of the material by having these interesting architectures. Um, what we actually saw, uh, and this is, uh, I should really say this is by accident, uh, most part, uh, was that, uh, I mean, we were just simply interested in comparing uh, the fracture behavior of metal on flexible substrate, but we just uh, was interested, we're interested in having a, uh, another 2D material, in this case, uh, graphene uh, underneath it. And, and the hope was, or thought was that, well, graphene is also conducting, so maybe this will help us to achieve higher uh, right, electrical failure strain. So that was just a thought. And, and it turns out it kind of delivered that, but the mechanism of doing that was very different from what we expected. So that's what I mean by unexpected. Um, so this is what you see if you have, let's say, uh, PDMS with uh, gold, copper, metal, or same metal with graphene underneath and you right, bend it. Um, similar to what the previous example show, you see very straight cracks in the metal, bare metal or metal on uh, PDMS. Um, when you have a single layer graphene, you start to see something that's drastically different. So it's no longer straight. So that's what, right, what you can see. The length scale of uh, fractures are also quite different. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then, well, because we're interested in using these as uh, electrical conductor, so we decided to simply just measure the conduct or resistance of the metal um, versus strain. So it's not a strength, so it's a right, resistance versus strain. Um, and if you plot the resistance in log scale, uh, the met bare metal looks like this. It's almost very straight going up. Uh, and, and so this almost right, reminded me of ceramic type of material, very brittle material, right, if it was strength. Um, and the graphing with the 2D, I mean, graphing with the metal, it actually created this quite interesting behavior. So here we start to see some almost like plasticity, right? There's some, right? Almost as if there's some dislocations working uh, through uh, the material. It's actually not, but, but it's very similar to that of uh, ductile, uh, uh, right? Deformation until you get uh, completely fractured. Um, and, and this resistance level is really, really not than 10 times of the original resistance of the metal. So if we start with few ohms, this is less like 10 ohms or less than that. So actually it's keeping that resistance for a long, strain until it breaks. Um, so, so that was quite bizarre, but, but that's what we saw. So we, we kind of termed this uh, electrical ductility. Uh, <laughs> that, that's the term we, we wanted to use. Uh, I mean, it, it, I know it's not quite right. It's mechanical electrical, but, um, but, but that's what, what this right, led us to. So it's interesting. There's some fracture business. There's some interesting electrical mechanical responses. So I wanted to understand this a little bit more. Um, so there, here are some fracture surfaces of bare gold or gold with, uh, in this case, titanium chrome uh, underneath um, PDMS, straight cracks. Uh, whereas when you just put a single layer graphene, you start to see these irregular domains and they start to create into smaller domains as you keep increasing uh, the bending strain. Um, and, and you can analyze these in many ways. Uh, something we've done was the width of the crack. So that's the width between the two domains or the domain size, size of your individual domain, uh, uh, averaging uh, number. Uh, you can see that uh, for the bear or the gold alone, you start to see continuous increase in width, whereas that of one layer inserted gold is start to have some more like saturation behavior. Uh, and also the domain size keeps decreasing. So there's, they're breaking into smaller pieces as you keep applying strain, whereas this basically gets saturated. So it gets saturated, so there's no further energy dissipation mechanism. You start to enlarge, right, the gap between these domains. Um, so if you say, well, this might be some, right, two different processes. So what if, if you do it one time? So this is what we did. This is bare copper. We just put one layer graphene here, two layer graphene there. And that's what you see. It drastically different fracture surfaces, right, as we kind of saw in the upper panel. So this is, right, really something to do with what's underneath and how did that, right, affects this fracture and, and lead to, right, this uh, interesting behavior. So that's what we studied. So here are... Um, kind of our hypothesis or what we think it's the, the mechanism. It's interesting how this ties back to the wrinkle or, or the buckle in this case. Um, 
having the graphing, our, our thought here is that having the graphing underneath uh, in between the gold uh, or tie gold and, and the PDMS, uh, because of the, um, the, the different adhesion uh, between just the metal with PDMS versus the graphene with a PDMS, you start to create in, in our uh, kind of microscopy evidences of these uh, uh, local buckles. They're, they're kind of localized delaminated buckle uh, that is you're seeing here. So we basically model I mean, the schematic that show as these out of plane localized deformation. And what's interesting is as you keep increasing the strain, these buckle basically guides the fracture of the goal. So because of the local strain that is on these uh, apex of these buckles, uh, you start to guide them. And what's interesting is since these are never uh, straight, right? They were like uh, uh, the, the one that you see in the bare gold, uh, you start to see very much uh, a interaction between these buckles or cracks. And at the same time, because of this irregular structures of the metals, you start to see some bridging effect that's happening between these uh, irregular islands. And, and, and we think that's kind of the, the main reason how the electrical properties can be maintained. It, it's, it's something that's still quite interesting to us, but here's just kind of how the cracks are, right? This is, I, I believe, yeah, the real time uh, that you're seeing, right? At, at a point, right? At a particular strain and increasing strain, you see that these uh, uh, cracks are kind of interacting and then you propagate. Uh, I, I don't have the video for uh, straight uh, crack propagation for that. It's like just a straight crack. There's really never any interaction and then any uh, further uh, kind of uh, gold patches kind of bridging effect uh, that can be seen. So here are experimental data that shows uh, the schematics I showed you earlier as uh, right resistance function of strain. So again, yeah, kind of bizarre to us at the very first right, measurement, but as you can see, so this is about its original resistance, 10 to the zero, so that's one. Um, and as you can see uh, with one layer, uh, sorry, no graphene, it shoots up, right? So this is where you started, it goes up very, very rapidly. And by having one layer, you start to see this plateauing region and three, uh, two layer and four layer. Um, so it was quite interesting to see this, right? Almost uh, right, elongation of, of this stable resistance. Uh, and you can define the failure strain by, by a way, I mean, in our case, just to be fair to all our calculation, uh, we keep it at uh, 10 to three, um, uh, increase, so it's about kilo ohm. In this case, you started from one ohm uh, because the graphene's resistance was one, about one kilo ohm. So we want to make sure, right, we don't, that doesn't play a significant role. So that was, that was why we, we cut it there, uh, just to compare uh, these numbers. And this behavior isn't, right, just for bending, you can do a twist. Um, that really shows, right, how robust this is to, to large twist angles by having additional layers of these material added in there. So, so really it seems like this is happening, right? And it's consistent uh, across, right? Uh, kind of, right? Uh, and it's enhanced even with more layers of graphene added. And, and here is also a uh, fatigue uh, a response or the, the characterizations where, right? The cycle performance really isn't perturbing uh, the failure of the, this material, uh, this system. Um, if you were wondering, well, what if, right? And, and I think that's a fair point of graphing being conducting. And, if, uh, and we, we concluded that that conducting nature does help uh, if you compare what I'm showing you versus with graphing. So if you analyze all the data uh, by putting not conducting layer, but semiconducting layer uh, MOS2 or hexaboron nitrate that's completely insulating as an interfacial material of different number of layers, uh, what you start to see is the similar behavior um, to that of right, graphene under bending. So this really, we think it's uh, the, the, the primarily due to this interesting fracture control or fracture right, patterns that we observe and subsequently affecting this uh, or enabling this interesting electrical behavior uh, by having this uh, interlayer system. Um, we, we attempted to um, kind of uh, understand this a little better. And this was a model that actually, uh, uh, I think this was uh, some sort of a carbon nanotube composite uh, type of model um, uh, developed. So there are crack generations uh, as, as we increase strain, but at the same time, there are continuous bridging 
that are enabled uh, by these uh, uh, nanostructures that's embedded in the in the elastomeric or, or, or polymer substrate. And, and our actually measurement actually fits really, really well with this type of model, which also suggests that that crack bridging that I talked about is, is, is part of right what we see as a result of this uh, electrical ductility or this enhanced uh, uh, stable resistance. Um, and one parameter that we can uh, find with this uh, exercise is as we change the number of graphene layers from one to four, uh, so-called our uh, fitting parameter, electrical ductility parameter actually increases. So compared to one layer, uh, four layers about 10 times uh, more. So that's why we're seeing this enhanced stability of uh, electrical resistance. Um, that can be learned by or quant quantitatively fit by this uh, uh, kind of uh, relation. So that helps us to really understand and, and also perhaps optimize the number of layers, right? How many layers are good? And, and so we've done a little bit of, of uh, analysis on that as well, but uh, I, I probably didn't bring it here. Um, and, and you can right, ask the question, so where would this be potentially useful for? I, I mean, I think we, there are lots of potential applications of these where right, we use lots of um, flexible interconnector, for example, for things to, to be right, in traditional like conventional electronics to uh, advance wearable electronics that lots of people are potentially interested in and developing. So, so we thought, well, by having this additional layer uh, for, for conduction and for control fracture that can help really maintain this uh, user alert functionality. It's really like right ductile versus brittle. Uh, when you have a ductile structure, you can see the plastic deformation and use that as your indication, right, to to uh, to look at your structure. So that that's kind of what we're trying to do here. So if you look at this uh, C under bending, uh, conventional, it gives you if you're crossing certain strain, abrupt uh, disconnection. Whereas in our case, right here, you get a more stable regions where you can tell you, okay, maybe we should think about right, examining or looking at our device uh, as we measure the luminous power uh, of, of this uh, line knitting devices that we have created. So here is just an example, um, right, how robust this is to strain, but also how, right, uh, that can be used for um, really alerting the user and, and, and really uh, make it more robust. So uh, I think that's all I have prepared for a talk today. And I hope I was able to show you a little bit, a glimpse of what we work on. Um, but really uh, two things that, uh, that I talked about is one on how, how right, useful the deformation uh, and strain associated deformation might be. So right, these elastic plastic deformation, of course we wanna avoid them in structural applications, but uh, for material application, those might be quite, quite interesting and useful. Um, and also, right, um, it kind of ties nicely with deformation, but the interface uh, could be something that we also could uh, right, think about in designing advanced uh, sensors or advanced devices right, that's going to be on their stream. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, ooh, yeah, very nice talks, uh, both uh, very interesting stories. Um, yeah, the floor is open for questions. You can raise hand or you can just speak up. Can I, can I ask a question here? Yes, yes, sure. Go ahead. Hi, this is Jay. I saw a very interesting talk. So I have a I have a question about the second part about the, you know, the, uh, you have an interlayer between the gold and also the PDMS. So you are you're directly starting from the bending, right? So bending to, to, to stretch that. So my question is, right? So why not just, you know, directly stretch them? For example, you only axial stretching? Sure, yeah. So yeah, I think people have done that. Um, I think there was a Jigang Su's work and in, in, I think I remember, uh, I forgot was what it's from Jigang Su's group or some, some other group. Um, what they have done and we, we look at that. So, I mean, I think the question we asked ourselves was, can we create a buckle, intentional buckle uh, where we can make this fracture to be more, um, more ductile, more, more, more less straight, right? So, so I think there, there was a work, um, I forgot now, uh, uh, on that. So actually you can use local, so basically once you create buckle, you have a local strain, so then the cracks are might, might be much more preferentially guided 
through that path. So there was uh, that piece of work a uh, number of years ago. So, so that's that. Um, and, and in our case, I think we want, I think from a fabrication point of view, we just wanted to be more, I guess, consistent or more uh, conventional in a sense that if you look at how industry does this, is they basically grab a foil and polyimid, for example, they'll just roll it uh, across. So basically that's how they bond them. Uh, sometimes there's some adhesive. So we thought, well, if we can do this with graphene layer in the middle, maybe we can make that process also relatively uh, robust. And maybe PDMS is what a lot, of, right, something that a lot more researchers are currently using for future, maybe more, right, more conformal electronics applications. So, so that yeah, that's kind of the reason we went that way, or the way we started was based on that thought. Uh, but, but of course, right, there could be a way to control these structures with intentional deformation. So that, that I think is still a very interesting way. Um, yeah. Okay, great, great. So so the set, my second question is, right, so now you are doing the bending, it's outward, right? So also mm -hmm. you show the compression case for the right. slide nine, uh, 29, uh, right. 29, right? right? right. So right. if you bend it the, the object away inward, right, mm -hmm. I'm supposed, right, depends on the, you know, bonding. And then you get, you, you could have some denomination there. Right. We, we might, so, so yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what was, um, yeah, so I, we haven't characterized the microscopy or electron microscope images of the compression, um, but we did look at the adhesion uh, mm -hmm. of um, graphene gold versus just tie gold, for example, on PDMS. So so we, we did the kind of traditional testing with tape test and uh, uh, like MD simulation to help us to look at adhesion energy. Uh, it turns out, um, and I think that's one point we kind of made uh, in, the, in the paper, the adhesion level, we, we happen to be in the right spot, I should say. So it's a little lower than tight gold, but it's not substantially lower um, than, so when, when you don't have titanium, for example, so it's just gold, the delamination is severe because adhesion is not very good between gold and PDMS or, or substrate. Mm -hmm. so, so it's much better than that, but it's actually low enough so it could Right, create these uh, buckles uh, through the thermal process, these processings that we do uh, because of mismatch right, of stiffness and, and, and stretching that might happen during this manipulation. So, uh, so that, that's kind of our understanding of uh, adhesion, um, but we, we haven't looked at details uh, in compression, how do they, right? How yeah. things will, yeah, delaminate or, or, or yeah. yeah, how would they behave? Yeah, that's a good, yeah, great point. Yeah, so also, you know, for the man work, this kind of uh, cracking pattern, right? So it, it may be different, I don't know, you know, in these two yeah. cases. Right, I, I think they're, they might be different because one yeah. is tension, yeah, yeah, yeah so, yeah, so definitely. definitely, yeah, <laughs> so it might be more complicated and maybe the, the delamination might play more role in that case, right? And yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. yeah, right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, wonderful talk, thank you. Okay, any, any other questions? Um, this is Brendan Knight, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Sorry, I should have raised my hand, I suppose. But um, yeah, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, I was just curious, for the exciton diffusion uh, and PL measurements, there's pretty cool stuff. How does this, does it have implications for flexible devices? So would you see similar strain levels in a flexible device, and then how would that impact the performance of the device? So I guess the practical applications of a flexible device that uses a 2D material mm -hmm. is gonna see similar fluctuations, or will it see similar fluctuations in, in shifts in band gap, et cetera, and, and impact on, on device behavior? Uh, that's a great question. So um, I think with the flexible devices, um, um, so if the strain is applied, uh, you see a change to, um, to optical band gap. So that's well established. Um, so you see about um, about 50 milli electron volt uh, change per percent strain, uh, roughly. So that depends on whether it's uniaxial, biaxial, but uh, a rough number would be about 50 milli electron volt. Um, uh, and I think with respect to drift, so it's basically you, you need a gradient uh, in real space or in, through some, some right direction. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, the pure bending won't do anything for that. So, so it will only change the energy. So I think people demonstrated if it was a photo sensor or photo diode, um, emitting diode, um, you could use strain to change the color. But, but again, it's only right 50 milli electron volts. So you, you don't see that color change. It's very, very small. Spectroscopically, you, you see that. 
Um, but if you are worried about drift, then it needs uh, something more like a heterogeneous strain profile on the surface or on a substrate. So it's a little, I guess for uh, uh, lots of potential applications, it may not go as much to that, um, but, but definitely there is uh, changes to, yeah, energy, uh, uh, optical, uh, yeah, band gap energy of, of these material uh, with respect to strain. So that, that's something probably people need to consider uh, if it's for, yeah, if it deal with any optical properties or, uh, yeah, yeah of these materials. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, thank you. You know, it reminds me that you bring up the, the drift I don't know the concept very well, but there's this idea of like a molecular or electronic ratchet or molecular ratchet. I forget how they, mm -hmm. they refer to. But if you oscillate this strain, you would you would essentially cause a, potentially a uh, oscillating current flow that you could extract mm -hmm. power. Is that is that a concept that makes any <laughs> sense? Uh, I, I think uh, if you do it in the right frequency, so, so I mean, I think the, there are some thoughts around. I mean, I, we got a little interest in, in in here. I mean, I guess if you are uh, solar mechanics person, right? There are things which we call statics. So these are relatively slowly moving stuff. So it's uh, right, slow, low frequency stuff. Um, but if you go to high frequency behavior, so if you can uh, create these exciton hole, electron hole pair excitons, and you can switch it with extremely high frequency closer to the lifetime of this material, right? Or this transition, you start to couple, yeah, maybe you can do that. So basically you, you, you could see some bizarre stuff. So then that will be closer to really this dynamics, uh, right? The fracture has its own fracture dynamics angles to it. So, so there might be some interesting things that could happen at high frequency uh, yeah. oscillation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah thank you. Yep. All right. Um, well, we're a few minutes after 11. If you have any one, one quick question, we can take it. Otherwise, we'll close off here. Okay, all right. Well, thank you again, uh, Sanwu. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. For yeah, we'll meet up with you later you. with a few yeah. more questions. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone uh, for yeah, thank coming you. to the talk today. Thank you, Linda. Yeah.